All right, everybody doing okay? We're just getting started, and now I want to introduce our keynote speaker for this men's conference today. And I'm guessing nobody, probably none of you, are unfamiliar with Father Larry Richards, <laughs> except for this guy over here. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of biographical information. I will say, just from a personal standpoint, every time I hear Father Larry Richards speak, I feel challenged in a good way. You always walk away uh, feeling like there's something more you need to do with your spiritual life, and he'll challenge you, and I'm sure that's not gonna, that's gonna be the case today as well, but uh, he speaks from experience. Uh, he, of course, is a pastor of an inner city parish. Uh, he was a high school chaplain, a counselor, an evangelist. Of course, many of you know him from radio and television. He's one of the most traveled priests, does a lot of conferences and missions as well. Um, born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he was ordained into the, <laughs> I don't know, that, uh, and he was ordained into the priesthood in 1989 for the Diocese of Erie, Pennsylvania, and he serves as the pastor of St. Joseph Church Bread of Life Community in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's also founder and president of the Reason for Our Hope Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading the good news by ed educating everyone about Jesus Christ. You may be familiar with the first book that he wrote. It came out back in 2009. It's called Be a Man, Becoming the Man God Created You to Be. How many of you all have read that? I bet you many of you have, yeah. It was the number one bestseller, sold 100,000 copies. He followed it up a couple of years later with his second book called Surrender, The Life-Changing Power of Doing God's Will, and that also was a bestseller as well. And so let us give a warm North Texas welcome to our keynote speaker for this men's conference, Father Larry Richards. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Are you ready? I don't think so. First thing, let's pray. Jesus is here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we thank you for your presence in our lives, for your presence in the Blessed Sacrament, that you who the universe cannot contain would humble yourself before us in the most blessed sacrament. Jesus, help us to know you, to love you, to serve you, so we may one day live with you forever in heaven. We beg you these things, Lord Jesus, in your most holy name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, well, we're going to be talking about the Eucharist and uh, coming to the table and the reality of how present God is to us in the most blessed sacrament. So please, if you would, open your Bibles with me to Luke's Gospel. Let me see your Bibles. Don't you hold up those phones, you pagans. <laughs> You've heard me before. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. So you need, you know, you guys in Texas are all about uh, weapons and that, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I'm carrying, Father. Woo, I'm impressed. I'm not impressed with nothing if you're not carrying the sword of the Spirit. Because your gun can't do squat according to my spirit of the living God here. This is a sword. You go keep you alive forever. Your gun will keep you alive for a hundred years. Big deal. You're going to die anyway. This is what you need. And you need to be carrying it. You need to be reading it. You need to be living it. So you know how to live and be a Christian man. And not just, well, I follow what this guy says. I don't care what that guy says. What does this guy I say this is what you and I should be reading every day and you need to carry it besides your phone I'm just saying so we're going to Luke's gospel for the ten of you our Protestant brothers who are here with us today thank you for being with us <laughs> and we're going to start off in Luke chapter 22 Luke chapter 22 verse 14 and following when the hour arrived, Jesus took his place at table. 
come to the table. Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then taking the cup, he offered a blessing and thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the coming of the reign of God. Then taking bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So as we focus on the Eucharist, we're going to focus and put it this in three different things. We got to believe, we got to receive, and we got to be transformed. We got to believe, we got to receive, and we need to be transformed. Okay, so let's first of all talk about belief. My biggest thing in the church these last years is been, I think the, the problem with the church isn't just the scandals, isn't just the divisions, isn't just all these things are out there. The problem is simple. It's a lack of faith. People don't have faith, even the ones that go to church all the time. And you can always tell because what is necessary to open up a sacrament? Faith. If you don't have faith, the sacrament doesn't work for you. This isn't magic. This isn't superstition. This is an encounter with the living God. Every sacrament is an encounter with the living God. And so we must approach this with faith. You ever sit there, how old are your kids when they get confirmed here in this area? 14, so they're in eighth grade? Boo. 99% of your kids that get confirmed don't have any faith. And how, you know how you can tell? Because they go up, the bishop puts his hands on them, or not anymore, or whatever. He does the thing, says, peace be with you. He goes back. Nothing changes. Why doesn't anything change? Because to open the sacrament, you need faith. You have people to go to church when people come to church on Sunday. And they go up and they receive the God of the universe in the Eucharist. And then they go back. And nothing has changed. Why has nothing changed? Because they don't have faith. You can tell the ones that absolutely don't have faith, the ones that leave Mass before the, uh, the closing prayer or the, uh, the uh, final blessing. Absolutely no faith. You're just going there to get your uh, ticket stamped so you can go. Because they told me if I miss Mass, I'm going to hell. So I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to go to church. And, but as soon as communion starts, I'm at this place because I am not here for Jesus. I am here so I can go to heaven. Again, if the only reason you follow Jesus Christ is so you don't go to hell, who do you love, gentlemen? yourself. It's an act of selfishness. We need faith. We need to believe. You know, and again, so when we talk about, when Jesus says, this is my body, you got to believe it. And you can say, oh yeah, I believe it, Father. Really? And I often, when I do a parish mission, it's been a long time since I've been, I was in McKinney uh, a couple years ago and did a parish mission over there. But, is that this diocese or? Yeah, anyway, so, and I'll sit there and I'll point at the tabernacle and I'll say to the people there, and I don't want to offend anybody here today. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Anyway, so I'll say, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ, the King, the King, the Lord of Lords, the God the universe cannot contain, is in that tabernacle? Let me see your hands. Whoa. How many of you go to daily mass? The rest of you are liars, right? Because if you really believe that that was God, and every single day he's feeding you with his very self, if you believed it, you would come on your knees to make sure you got to Mass. You just would. You know, again, all these people, we just went through the whole pandemic, and we couldn't have Masses at a lot of places, and most places in the world. And yet, as soon as they opened it up, People didn't come back to church, right? Because why? 
I might get sick. Did you go to a restaurant? Well, yeah. Did you go to the bar? Well, of course. Did you go to the uh, go shopping? Yes. Did you go to work every day? Yes. But you stopped. You didn't go to mass. Well, no. It's because you have no faith, huh? As soon as they get, as soon as we gave you that get out of free card, you took it and say, "Good, I'm not going. I don't have to." You know, and to me, I'm very controversial in lots of things. Like for me, my biggest thing was we should get rid of the obligation forever. Because then only people who come to Mass is the people who want to come to Mass. Not the people that, uh, oh yeah, I have to go every week because I said I'm going to hell and I don't want to go to hell. I would say stay home. Because you're not coming with faith anyway. You're coming for you so you can get something out of God instead of coming because you believe in him. You know, every time we come to Mass, it ain't just a ritual. You do realize, gentlemen, ritual without love is rape. If you just come to Mass out of the ritual, but you don't love Jesus, you don't believe in Jesus, it's just like raping God. Because it's just going through the motions. That's not what God wants of you. He wants a living, intimate relationship with him. So when Jesus says, take this, all of you, and eat it, this is my body, believe it. And then he says what? Do this in remembrance of me. So every time we come to Mass, we're saying, Jesus... I remember you. This is about an intimate relationship, Jesus, between me and you. I've been a priest in a month that'll be 32 years. And as a priest of 32 years, the greatest thing I do as a priest, the most important thing to me I do as a priest is say mass. So this morning I woke up at 3.55 and as I woke up at 3.55, so I could do my holy hour and do mass. And so I said mass in the hotel room. And I stop at the Our Father so I can be an hour with Jesus. And I offered up today this mass for you and for your intentions. But that ain't why I said the mass. I said the mass as I've done every day for the last 32 years. So I can be with Jesus. To think about the God the universe cannot contain. Think about it. What's beyond the universe? The universe. What's be the universe cannot contain God. And yet, he allows himself to be present in the most blessed sacrament. And then he says, not only am I going to be with you, because remember the last promise he made us, know that I am with you always until the end of the world. Not only am I going to be with you, I will feed you with myself. You know, there are people, nobody here, but there are people that go to mass that are bored. Can you imagine? How could anybody ever go to mass and be bored? What does it cost Jesus Christ for us to go to mass? His life. So what must the mass cost us? Our life. It's a life for a life. And it's this intimacy of relationship. So gentlemen, the first thing I got to ask you is, do you really believe? You raised your hands. But what in your life changes because of your Eucharistic belief? Do you have, like again, if you can't go to daily mass, and I'm sure some of you work, and you know, some churches have their first daily mass at 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, that's only for the people getting prepared to die, the old people. So they have it at 8 o'clock because they're the ones that are going to go. But you can't get people that are working by if they have an 8 o'clock mass. Don't you have anything earlier? Uh, no, the priest will have to wake up early. Oh, please. Sorry, Father. I have no idea what the mass schedule is here. So I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's they have mass at 4 o'clock in the morning. Right, Father Rudy? Yeah, good job. Anyway, but the reality is that... If you can't, if you believe it, then my grandmother had a ditty and she says, every time I pass a church, I stop and make a visit. So when the time comes when I'm wheeled in, you know, in a casket, he won't say, who is it? 
Every time I pass a church, I stop and make a visit. So when the time comes when I'm wheeled in, he won't say, who is it? And so, one of the greatest things I always tell people is decide today that you're never ever going to go to work without stopping at the church first. And if the churches are locked, like some places keep their churches locked because there are pagans there, then the whole church is a tabernacle. Stop at the front of the church. Stop and say, Jesus, come to work with me today. Or stop in there. You know, again... Like my growing up, you know, I've told a story about my dad here before. And, but as I was growing up, my father, who was a cop, before he came home at night, where do you think he stopped? The bar first, right? Because he thought it was easier to come home to deal with me and everybody else if he had a few in him. It was harder for the rest of us, but he stopped every day. That was his ritual, Stop and have a, a beer. Again, I'm from Pittsburgh, so people in Pittsburgh, you know what you drink? A shot and a beer. A shot and a beer. And so he would have a shot and a beer, or two, or three, or four. And then I'd come home. Could you imagine if you made it part of your ritual that before you went to work, you'd stop at a church, you know, for a minute? Either run in, kneel down in front of the Blessed Sacrament and say, Jesus, I love you. I give you my life. Come to work with me. Or on the way home, you stop at the church, kneel down. Jesus, I love you. I give you my life. Come home with me, Jesus. Let me be your presence to my wife and my kids. Jesus, if we believe in his presence, we will stop there and see and spend time with him. At my place, we have perpetual adoration. I'm the only church in the whole diocese of Erie, 13 counties with perpetual adoration. And again, when I started it, you know, they looked at me at the most powerful reality in the world is Christ's presence. He's more powerful than a nuclear bomb. He just is. Like when I got there, one of the first things I was going to do was start perpetual adoration. And my bishop at the time, I had another bishop then, and he would sit there and he would not let me do it. And I went to him and I says, uh, Bishop, can I start perpetual adoration? He goes, no. And I went to him again and I said, Bishop, can I start perpetual adoration? He says, no. And so I start building the adoration chapel. And then as I, I went and I have one of these old churches with, uh, you know, St. Joseph. Is St. Joseph here anywhere? No, the Blessed Mother here? Oh, she's back there. Anyway, but again, you, Father Rudy, put a St. Joseph statue here. It's here is St. Joseph. Anyway, you did a great job in that talk too, Father. Great job about St. Joseph. Now put a statue up. Anyway, so I go. So sorry, Father. Please excuse me. Anyway, so we sit there and uh, I have at my church, it's 152 years old, a hand-carved back altar from Germany. It's beautiful. You know, you walk in, the sky is blue because when you go to church, you're going to heaven. And then on the side, I have the old side altars. I have side altars. And so on the side over here is St. Joseph's side. I, when, I, when the bishop told me no, I took a miraculous medal. I crawled up the high altar of St. Joseph. I put the miraculous medal at the foot of St. Joseph and I said, Joseph, the bishop said no, but I know you'll say yes. So I went back to the bishop. I said, Bishop, can I start perpetual adoration? He said, I told you no. I said, I already asked St. Joseph. He said, yes. I don't care who you ask. I said no. So when he came and uh, blessed the adoration chapel, it was a great day in the, in the, in the diocese of Erie. And he asked me the same thing, Larry, why do you want this? I said, for the holiness of my people and two, to close the damn abortion clinic. Larry, don't say those type things. Okay, so then when we, if we had it blessed, the TV station was there and the, uh, papers were, the paper was there and the TV stations were there. And he says, Father Larry, why are you doing this perpetual prayer before God? And I said, one, for the holiness of my people and two, to close the damn abortion clinic. Can we quote you? Please. Front page of the local Times, the very Times paper. It says, Father Larry Richards is going to close, they took the word damn out, the abortion clinic. And everybody laughed. Ha, 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 Now, everyone at my parish, of course, you, got, you just can't join my parish. You got to go through three classes. And I teach all three. 
And so, everybody has to be on the same page. You can come to my church, but you can't join unless you're all on the same page. So the first thing, what's it mean for Jesus to be Lord? You know, you got to believe in the real presence. You got to believe no artificial birth control. You got to believe, uh, you got to be pro-life. You got to uh, tithe. You got to pray with your families. You got to do all this stuff. First thing. So everyone at my parish is pro-life. Period. There is not one person at my parish that would not be pro-life. They couldn't handle me. They would go out of their miserable mind. But anyway, so in the midst of it, so I sat there and I says, what we're going to do is we're going to close the abortion clinic. Because I'm on 24th Street and the abortion clinic is 18th Street. And they said, okay. So we start praying. Adder, we started perpetual adoration 16 years ago on uh, Ash Wednesday. And we start praying. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we start praying. And then, so we started this in February. The abortion clinic closed June 1st of that year. And they sat there and the, uh, the newspapers came to me and they says, Father, are you taking any credit? Of course not. But Jesus is. You can't kill babies that close for we adore the God of the universe. Well, what if it opens again, Father? We'll close it. Three years later, they opened the abortion clinic, same place. What are you going to do, Father? We'll close it. You know how long the abortion clinic stayed open? Two weeks. And then, this is uh, 10 years ago, they sold the clinic. There isn't one abortion in the whole diocese of Erie, Pennsylvania. Because why? Because of belief in the real presence. You know, some people, they have become people that are filled with this being down and they're always negative and they're always critical and they're always like, you know, cynics. If you're negative, cynic, you have no faith. Enough of this stuff. You got to believe that God can do anything. They laughed at me. My bishop laughed at me. You're going to close an abortion clinic. No, I'm not. Jesus is. When are we going to sit there and stop worrying about how bad the country is, how bad the church is? Oh, the devil got in charge. Get over that stupidity. Who's stronger, the devil or God? Then stop giving the devil any credit. He's nothing. Jesus is God and Jesus is there. Believe it. Start having faith. Start bringing this faith and light into the world. Stop being part of the darkness. Oh, how bad it is. Get over yourself. How bad it is. There is bad there, but there's been darkness since the beginning of time. But have you ever been in a dark room, no matter how dark the darkness is, if you light a match, shh, the darkness can never conquer the light. The light is always stronger. Will you bring the light of Christ to the world? Will you be one of those miserable Catholics that just talk about how bad it is and the devil's in charge and the devil's winning and we got to fight him? Oh, stop it. Be a man. Be a man of faith. Be a man that brings the light of Christ into the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But then he said, you are the light of the world. Believe it. And so again, so another way you can prove your belief is you become one who does adoration an hour a week, once a week. Do you have adoration in this area anywhere? In most of your parishes? Do you all do adoration once a week? Don't lie to a priest, you go to hell forever. <laughs> Gentlemen, when I started the Adoration Chapel at my parish, I said, first of all, to be an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, you first have to do a holy hour. No extraordinary devotion, no extraordinary minister. I don't want you to get up there and say, oh, look at me. Tell everybody what you do for God. Oh, I'm a Eucharistic minister. I'm an extraordinary minister at my church, Body of Christ. Look how holy, Body of Christ. I am so holy, Body of Christ. Do you do a holy hour? Nope, off. You're no longer going to be an extraordinary minister of the Holy of Jesus. You prove it by doing a holy hour first. Now you can be an extraordinary minister. I had people leave my church over that. 
Can you imagine? They went to the cathedral. The I hate Father Larry group at the cathedral. Because I told them they had to spend an extra hour with God. And I told them, okay, goodbye. But I said, when you're dying on your deathbed, you're not going to be sitting here saying, I can't believe I spent an extra hour with Jesus every week. I can't believe my pastor called me to do that. You'll be thanking almighty God that you had a miserable human being as a pastor who's been pastor now going on 20 years. And my parish keeps growing. It's not dying. You'd think people wouldn't want to come. I don't know what's going on. But it's a challenge because, gentlemen, like, again, if anyone asked me to sign their book, I'll sit there and I'll sign it and I'll say the same thing. I'll say, what's your name? And you'll say, my name is Joseph. Oh, and here's St. Joseph. And then I'll sit there and say, dear Joe, be a saint. God bless Father Larry. Then I'll hand it back to you and I'll say, or go to hell. You understand? Those are the only options you have, gentlemen. You become a saint or you go to hell. Is there any other option? I'll go to purgatory, Father. Shut up. You're going to be a saint. You're on your way. But I would not be shooting for purgatory, gentlemen. Because if you're shooting for purgatory and you don't make it, yeah, hell. But if you shoot to be a saint and you don't make it, purgatory. So you got a desire to be a saint. So if you're going to be a saint, a sanctity is when God's will and our will become one. So the most important thing you got to be doing in your own life, men, is being a man of prayer. And so to spend an hour with Jesus once a week, again, the way I do it, I make my men do the middle of the night. Huh? Now, when, when we have it, or, uh, I do my time Fridays from 3 to 4. Someone replaces me. Right now, it's not mandatory because we still, we still have the hours and we still perpetuate adoration, but you can go in there because some of the older people can't do it. But when I was getting to the guys in the beginning, I'd say, gentlemen, come on, you got to sign up. And they'd all look at me like a lot of you do, like, you're a nut, Father. Yes, I am. I'm a nut for Jesus. Thank you. But then I'd say, gentlemen, if I promised you, if you came to adoration for an hour a week in the middle of the night, for one year, at the end of the year, I'll give you a million dollars. Do you think people would come? Do you think you'd go out of your way for that? I get a million dollars? Yeah, the only thing I have to do is get up in the middle of the night once a week and spend an hour in that chapel? Yeah, that's all you got to do for a million dollars. Okay, Father, I'll do it. Okay, then why won't you do it for Jesus? Because you have no faith. You believe in money. You believe in the power of money. You'd be willing to do anything. You'd go to daily mass if someone was going to give you a million dollars. You'd do anything for money. But for Jesus, to get to know Jesus better, to get to spend time with him in eternity, ah, yo, no, I I I can't do that. You know, again, isn't it amazing that we want people, even priests, we want our priests to be milquetoast, correct? You know, like for instance, do you guys in Texas... Do you follow high school football and that around here? Is football a big thing here? Anyway, so you go and you get a coach and you say, okay, I'm going to get this coach. I want to be the best football player. I want the best team. And you get a coach and say, okay, coach, what should we do? What should we do? Tell us what to do. And they go, I like you just the way you are. Could you, don't get mad at me, but could, could, you, could you try to come to practice once a week for 45 minutes to an hour? And could you have good thoughts about the game? What would you do with that coach? Get out of here. What kind of coach are you? But that's what we want from our priest, isn't it? Hey, guys, I know it's hard. Oh, please, it's so hard. You know, can you, can you try to come to church once a week for 45 minutes to an hour, depending on which one of us have mass? And could you try to be a good person? That's garbage, gentlemen. You mean to win a state championship, to be good in football, you have to work out every day, hard, hard, hard. But to go to heaven? Uh Uh-uh. Just don't, just try to be a good guy, guys. Just try. Try to be a good person. I was once doing a men's conference years ago, and there was a uh, deacon there. One of the speakers used to play uh, basketball, uh, professional basketball. And he gets up there and with the guys and he says, oh, guys, I know it's so hard. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, let's, let's try this. Guys, come on, together we can do this. Let's try when you're driving to work, you know the bumps in your car, your steering wheel? 
Just pick 10 of them and try to say one decade of the rosary every day. Can you do that, guys? And I'm sitting out in the congregation, and I am fuming. Really. So I got up, and the deacon left, and he had to fly back to Cisna Loretto, Pennsylvania. And I said, wasn't the deacon great? Yeah, I loved him. And I said, Does, wasn't he great when he said, guys, try to say what, one decade of the rosary every day. Could you do that while you're going to work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, gentlemen, you pray every day or you go to hell. Do you understand me? We like the deacon better. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so easy. Gentlemen, it's enough for the milk toast. It's enough. You need to be a man of God. You need to be the leader of your family spiritually. Again, if you knew someone was going to break into your house tonight and rape your wife and kill your children, would you take a bullet to stop them? Oh, don't beat. We in Texas? Uh, yeah, maybe. Oh, no, Father. I'd use a bullet. I'd put a bullet through them. Ooh, big guy. Well, you know what? If you're willing to die for your family, for something physically, because they're going to die anyway. If you're not a man of prayer, you leave your wife and your children unprotected. If you're not praying every day, you are not the protector God has called you to be as a, fan, as a man. I do my holy hour in the morning to get to know Jesus, but it's also, I got to look at the world, the flesh, and the devil and say, you got to go through me before you get to my parish. In your prayer, gentlemen, when you're praying every day, you look at the world, the flesh, and the devil and say, you gotta go through me before you get to my wife and kids. The problem with some of you is you let your wife be the spiritual leader of the family. So your wife has to go in prayer and she has to go before the world, the flesh, and the devil and say, you gotta go through me before you get to my family because my husband's a wimp. Isn't that something? That you let your wife be the spiritual leader of the family. Gentlemen, it's time to have faith to know the reality of this. So the first thing you got to do is you got to believe. The second thing you got to do is you got to receive. And when you receive, you can't receive from TV. You know, again, on my, uh, when we started this, I start uh, doing my uh, mass with my phone, you know? And I have, on Podbean, 7,000 people on average, seven to 8,000 people every day that listen to my daily homilies, and I'm on YouTube, and three to 5,000 people listen to my homilies and watch my mass on YouTube. So 10,000 people every day listen to my daily homilies. These people will not have to go to purgatory. But the reality is that... This isn't enough. It just isn't. They say, oh, Father, I feel so much more intimate with Jesus now. It's not enough. I'm sorry. You need to receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Why? Because Jesus wants to live inside of you. Again, the reason we don't do this is because we don't get it. Catholics like to categorize, especially men. My degree's in psychology. Men love to categorize, right? And so, that's why a man can fight with his wife one minute and have sex with her the next. Because that's two entirely different realities. My sexual life, my fighting life. Now, that couldn't happen ever because your wife doesn't see life like that at all. It's all the same. Oh no, we just got done with a fight. You think we're going to have sex now? No, 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 no. But guys can categorize, this is my spiritual life, this is my work life, this is my family life, instead of this is my life. God must become your life. And then what we need to do is when Jesus comes inside of us, we need to live to be tabernacles of the living God, right? Like I taught all boys at an all Catholic boy high school. And so, and we had anywhere from 650 to 700 boys. Like you've heard me say, one year literally we had 666 boys. Six, 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 the sign of the Antichrist. So he threw out one the first week to get rid of that number. But anyway, 
But in dealing with this and uh, the reality of uh, dealing with these boys and being transformed, I would sit there and say, we were a cathedral prep, so our chapel was the cathedral of the diocese. And I would say to them, gentlemen, how many of you You'd never would you come in here in front of the tabernacle and have sex with your girlfriend. Would you ever do that? And the guys would look at me and say, that's disgusting, Father. But a few of the guys would go, well, yeah, maybe. But I'd say, if you would never ever have sex in front of the tabernacle, you better not have it anywhere else outside of marriage. Why? Because you are the tabernacle. Don't you get it, gentlemen? You don't leave Jesus here after you go to communion. You are Jesus now. Jesus is inside of you. You know, I have a priest that tells people, Jesus stays inside of you for 10 minutes after communion, so be still. Shut up. So as soon as you receive communion, the tick-tock starts. Start the talk watch. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Nine minutes more. Tick-tock. You better hurry up and talk to me. Eight minutes more. Seven minutes more. Thirty. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Four. Three. Two. One. Bam. I'm gone. Sorry. That's heresy. Jesus Christ took up residence inside of you the day you got baptized. Paul says, do you not know you are the temples of the living God? And then Paul later would say, talk about explicit, but Paul says, if you have sex with a prostitute, what are you doing? You make Jesus Christ have sex with a prostitute. Why? Because Jesus is inside of you. When you receive Jesus, you become one with Jesus. Jesus lives inside of you. It's going to be on my gravestone when I die at 120 because the good die young. Galatians chapter 2, 19 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer my own. What? Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith. Thank you, one person. It's a life of faith, a life of faith. I no longer live, Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a life of faith in Jesus who loved me and gave his life for me. Gentlemen, you receive Jesus so Jesus can grow in love and be and grow inside of you. That's why, again, John the, John the Baptist said, what was the famous line of John the Baptist? Do you remember? When they're talking about Jesus and everybody's going to Jesus, John says, I must decrease, he must increase. The more you and I receive the Eucharist, the more Jesus increases and the more we decrease. Because the world is called to see Jesus Christ, right? And so if Jesus lives inside of me, then I got to start living a life of Christ in the world. You know, again, I think too many Christians believe that we are the ones that just follow the commandments and we follow the rules of what Jesus said. Gentlemen, that's not true. God lives inside of you. You need to surrender to him and let him take full control of your life. So that means, is Jesus completely Lord of every part of your life? Huh? You know, and sometimes people say, well, yeah, well sure, Father, I go to church. Oh, please, you can be an atheist and go to church. Is that true? Absolutely. You can be an atheist and obey all the commandments. So what? What? Do you know Jesus? Remember, again, in the, the old catechism, but it's in the new catechism, the universal catechism, it says, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to know him, to love him, and serve him in this world so I can be happy with him forever and the next. So, your first question I'm asking you is, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him like your best friend? Do you know him like your spouse? Do you know Jesus Christ? Not know about him, not going to church. Do you have an intimate, 
relationship with Jesus. Do you know that you no longer live, you died, and now Jesus Christ is inside of you? And if not, gentlemen, what are you going to do to get there? And the first thing you're going to do is become that man of prayer. And when you're praying, you're going to listen more than you talk, which means you're going to hand over control. And you hate that. And so do I. Because men love to be in control. Gentlemen, look at the cross. Take a good look. That was the most powerful moment in all of history. When the God of the universe was nailed to a cross. Notice, gentlemen, there's nothing on that cross about Jesus. It was all about you and all about the Father. He gave his life away. And we hate that. We like it because he did it for us. But when he said now at the Mass, do this, this in memory of me. He's saying, feed the world with everything that you are because that's what I do and I did. So we need to give away our life every day. Every day we got to give away our life, huh? Again, if you've ever heard me before, I always say when you leave this place today, what I want you to do is I want you to go home and I want you to put three words on your mirror. And those of you who have heard me, I'm sure you have those words on your mirror. What are the three words you have to have on your mirror? <laughs> I'm not coming back here. <laughs> I am third. What are the three words? I am third. God is first. Others are second. I am last. Mother Teresa said it this way, a life of joy. J, Jesus first. O, others second. Y, yourself last. So every night, gentlemen, you're brushing your teeth and you see the I am third. Do, 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 do. You think, or you should do an examination of conscience, that I do at least one unselfish act for another human being today. That I give my life away for another human being by doing one unselfish act today. And if the answer is no, you wasted your life in Christ today. You only lived for yourself. What a wasted life. A life of selfishness. This is the type of life we're called to live. So when we receive him, we got to be then transformed into him. So the first thing you got to do is you got to believe. The second thing you got to do is you got to receive. And now you got to be transformed, transformed into Jesus. There's one question everybody asks you and me when we say we are followers of Jesus. Sir, I would like to see Jesus. That's what they're asking you people. And we got to show the world Jesus Christ. Now, every one of us here are going to show a different side of Jesus. But we still got to show the world Jesus. Huh? Like, again, I've told the story before about my, I have a classmate. We're ordained together. He went to Rome. You know, he's a good man. He's a monsignor. He'll probably be a bishop. You do realize I'm not the type that will ever become a bishop. You know that. Could you imagine? Anyway, the church doesn't have that kind of imagination. But anyway, so he sits there, and I was with all boys at an all-boys school, Catholic high school, and he was at a co-ed Catholic high school. And he would sit there and have the kids, you know, and kids would walk by. He'd say, hey, come here, come here. And he'd say, I want to tell you a secret. What, Father? And he'd say, I think you're special. Isn't that nice? When I taught all boys, I would sit there and I would hit them into a locker as I was walking down the hall. Hit them into another locker. Ten of them would try to jump me. I'd say, you touch a priest, you go to hell forever. Huh? But the reality was, I would sit there and say, gentlemen, don't you ever think I'm going to say, come here. I want to tell you a secret. I think you're special. Ain't ever going to happen. Nowadays, you get arrested. 
But the reality was my way of showing the kids that I loved them was being strong on them, right? When the little freshman would come in, I'd say, gentlemen, I will be your spiritual drill instructor. There will be days you think I hate your guts, but I'll do everything in my power to get you to heaven. And that's the main thing we need to do is get people to heaven. Now again, even though I would be strong on those boys, for confession, we'd have 10 priests there, and we would have, I'd be up in a sanctuary, and my line for my confessional would go to the back door. And I'd have to get up halfway through the confessional, because these other nine priests are sitting there with nobody there. And I'd say, gentlemen, please get out of my line and go to somebody else. Why? Because though they knew I could be hard, they knew I loved them. They knew it. And I would die for them. They knew it. To this day, my busiest day of the year is Father's Day. People from all over the world literally will call me on Father's Day and say, Father, you are my father. Because I beget spiritual life in them. And I challenge them to be the best. You know, when people sit there and say, oh, Father, you're just arrogant. Oh, Father, you know, you're very opinionated. Oh, Father, you don't get it. I could be at home right now. I've been trying to pass a kidney stone for the last month. I did it right before I came out here. Literally. It was just like, yeah, I know. If you saw me got up, I thought, oh, I don't feel very comfortable right now. And I walked out and went, bang. Oh, thank you, God. But anyway, the reality is that it's here. I come here to get you to heaven, to challenge you to be saints. I don't just come here to yell at you, to make you laugh, and walk, have you walk out of here and say, I hate his guts. Just get in line. You need to go to heaven. And you need to put that as your first priority. And as you go and you struggle to go to heaven, as you're transformed into Jesus, they want to see Jesus. And I I love the story I heard years ago. And it's a true story. It's about a man who sat there and he was an American and he was captured in the Second World War and was thrown into the prisoner of war camp in Japan. And while he was there, he was... uh, Treated badly, he was a prisoner of war, but at the same time there was a Japanese man there who was trying to help the Americans and he was captured and he was thrown into the same cell. But because he was a traitor, they tortured this man. And every day when they'd throw the the Japanese man in with the American, the American would take his own food and give it to the Japanese man and they'd try to heal the wounds of the Japanese man as as best he could. Well, this happened for about a month. And at the end of that month, they tortured the Japanese man so badly and they threw him back in the cell with the American. And the American knew he wasn't going to make it through the night. He was going to die. And this American thought, I've shared everything with this man except for the love of Jesus. And so he knelt next to him and he goes, you know, you're probably going to die tonight. But if you would just surrender your life to Jesus, you will live forever. You know what the Japanese man said to the American? He said, if this Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Gentlemen, could your wives say that about you? Oh, honey bun, if Jesus Christ is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could your kids say that about you? Oh, dad, if Jesus Christ is anything like you, can't wait to meet him. Could your neighbors say that about you? Could your employees say that about you? Could the people you work with say that about you? Because what the world needs today more than anything else is Jesus Christ. They don't need, it doesn't need Father Larry Richards and it doesn't need you. It needs Jesus to come back to being the light, to be transformed into Jesus, to showing the world Jesus Christ. We, in this octave of the resurrection, we must be proof that Jesus Christ is alive. When people say, is Jesus alive? You say, look here. He lives inside of me. That means, gentlemen, we got to work in love because, you know, I have a new book coming out called Just Live It. 
And this call, book just called Just Live It is living the 10 principles of the world's most famous prayer. What do you think that is? The Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. And so the opening line of the book is, <laughs> not you are going to die, I already used that one, is we were created by love, to be love in a world that doesn't know love. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of love because God is love. That's most expressed on the crucifix. That's what love is. We too now need to be an incarnation of love. So when people look at us men, we must be the most loving people there are. Your kids should be able to say about you, my dad is the most loving man I know. Your wife should be able to say, my husband is the most loving man I know. We must be love. So everyone asks you and I the same question. Sir, I would like to see Jesus. Jesus didn't tiptoe through the tulips. He didn't sit there and make everybody feel comfortable. In fact, he challenged them so much, they killed him. It might happen to us. Aren't you excited? Don't you wish you could be a martyr for Jesus? A martyr for the church? We have to be these martyrs every single day. By taking the one life God has given us, letting Jesus Christ live inside of us, and giving our life for the world. Cursing the darkness by bringing his light. You got it? You get it? You're going to do it? May each of you know his love today and forever. Amen. Be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you, he who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you.